Welcome to the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book, presenting a virtual school visit with Sherry Fu. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple notes before we begin. Please share your questions for the author using the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the event. Also, this event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with the transcript tab at the bottom of your window. If you'd like to rewatch this event later, it will be available along with other videos from festival speakers at vabook.org slash watch. Now, I'm pleased to introduce today's featured author. Sherry Fu, author of Little Messy Marcy Sue, is the mother of two audacious little girls. Inspired by childhood's wonder, wondrous humor and optimism, she began imagining stories that reflected her own family's cultural experience. She lives in Austin with her messy husband and messier daughters. Welcome, Sherry. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. So Little Messy Marcy Sue is a high pitch rhyming text about messiness that any child and parent can relate to, featuring a unique Chinese American intergenerational twist. Sherry's playful humor and bouncy rhythms set against Julie Kwan's expressive illustrations perfectly captures how a plucky daughter's exuberance and a tired mom come together amidst the beautiful chaos that surrounds them. Sherry, take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for the introduction. I am so happy to be part of the Virginia Festival of the Book and to share my picture book with you today. So as Sarah mentioned, I'm from Austin, Texas, and I live in Austin, Texas with my husband and my two daughters. And Austin is the capital of Texas, um, but I used to live in Washington, DC, uh, which is the capital of the United States. And um, my family moved during the pandemic. So we um, had a lot of friends and family in DC, so it was very hard to move. And in particular, my um, mother-in-law and father-in-law, my, my husband's parents, they are they live in a town outside Charlottesville, Virginia called Crozet. And so we've spent a lot of time there for the holidays and in general, um, and we've gone peach picking and gone to the restaurants and shops there and visited the university there. So I'm, I'm very familiar with that area. And in fact, I will be in Crozet in just a couple of weeks to visit them. So I will be in Virginia very soon. So I also just wanted to share a little bit about my daughters. I, I have two kids, they're five and seven. And um, you may be around their ages. The seven-year-old just lost her two front teeth. And I'm told that it's very typical to lose your bottom two teeth and then your top two teeth, which is what happened to my daughter. And my younger daughter is in preschool and she's learning to read. So that may be what some of you are going through now. And her favorite thing to do is to, um, she likes to stand on the, the arm of our living room sofa and she launches herself onto the cushions, which she thinks is really fun, but I think is really scary because I think she's gonna get hurt. So um, I wrote this book, Little Messy Marcy Sue, that I'm going to read to you now. And um, I think of the main character as being about the same age as my daughter's, but I actually wrote the story a few years ago. So while the story is not about my daughter's, which people ask a lot, it's actually, I see a lot of their spirit in Marcy Sue and vice versa. So I'm going to share my screen so that I can share the book with you. Okay, I think you should all be able to see my screen now, but please ping me if you don't. All right. Little Messy Marcy Sue, written by Sherry Fu and illustrated by Julie Kwan. I wanted to mention a little bit about Julie Kwan. She's an amazing illustrator and she has written two, she has illustrated two other books, Peter Lee's Notes from the Field by Angela Ahn and The Fearless Flights of Hazel Ying Lee by Julie Lung. She's fantastic. Marcy Sue couldn't help but make messes, track mud on the floors, and get stains on her dresses. 
She always had bruises and scrapes on her knees from running fast races and climbing tall trees. Early one Sunday on a bug hunting scout, Marcy jumped up when she heard her mom shout, Messy Marcy, your room is a sty. Why can't you clean? Oh, why Marcy, why? Wai Po and Wai Gong are coming today. Just look at this mess, what will they say? They'll think you were raised by wolves in the wild or worse, that you're spoiled and ill-behaved child. You ask why I call you my shell Luan Luan. It could be the dirt that's caked onto your hands. Get yourself dressed, no mud stains allowed. Please pick up your things and make mama proud. Well, Marcy Sue never did shrink from a task. She thought, we'll do more than my mama had asked. I'll start out by running the washing machine. Mama will say, your clothes, hao gan ting. So Marcy ripped out all the family's attire and polka dot sheets from the washer and dryer. The hallway looked like the machines had exploded, but Marcy was dei, her own clothes now loaded. Next, Marcy merrily skipped down the hall to grab Mama's vacuum plugged into the wall. She fluttered about getting fuzz off the floor, unaware of the chaos raging outside her door. The twice tangled cord knocked over the lamp. Down went the whopping with Mama's new plant. The framed family portrait plunged straight to the ground with a deafening bang and a shattering sound. Clueless to all the mayhem she'd wrought, I need a quick bath, was Marcy's next thought. She filled up the tub for a warm, soapy scrub. She splished and she splashed, singing rub-a-dub-dub. Speeding to dress herself, Marcy was beaming. Her ribbons pulled tight, but the faucet still streaming. The bubbles were flowing, spilling onto the floor soaking the mat as they crept toward the door. Just then, the Tsao Yin prompted Mama to check, and she gasped when she saw that her home was a wreck. Who was to blame? Oh, Mama knew who. Mercy Sue, Mercy Sue, what on earth did you do? I stacked all my books. I can reach the top shelf. Did you notice I washed all my laundry myself? I picked up my toys so no one will fall. I vacuumed the rug. There are no crumbs at all. Don't I look nice? I got myself dressed. Don't say it. I know you are truly impressed. Mama Sue stared speechless with shock, unsure what to do as she glanced at the clock. Just at that moment, the front doorbell chimed as Wai Po and Wai Gong arrived right on time. Wai Po exclaimed, Dola, hello, the house is a mess. Aya, oh no. Marcy Bobe, your room is pristine. You must have worked the whole morning to clean. But the rest of the house, it looks like a zoo. Why can't the others be more like you? The end. So thank you for listening to my book. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the elements of the story with you. And I'd like for this to be interactive so that I hope that the teachers will be able to type in some answers and thoughts that your classes have. So the first thing, um, I'd love to talk a little bit about foreign languages. As you heard in the story, Marcy speaks some Chinese and she mixes it in when she's thinking and talking. Um, so I would love if you can put in the chat 
ask your students if they speak any foreign languages. And I'd love to see the range of languages that we have represented in the classes. And in the meantime, um, I'll talk a little bit about how I learned Chinese. So my parents um, were immigrants to the United States from Taiwan. And they spoke to me and my sister in Chinese when we were growing up. And um, when we only spoke Chinese when we were very young, but once we got to the school, we mostly spoke English with our classmates and teachers. So when we were older kids, we ended up speaking what I called Chinglish to my parents, which is a mix of Chinese and English. So sometimes I would say mostly Chinese sentences, but I wouldn't have the vocabulary in Chinese to say something. So then I would switch to English. Um, or sometimes I would be speaking English and I would feel like I didn't have exactly the right word and the Chinese word would express it better. So then I would switch to Chinese. So it was very much a mix. Um, and this, maybe some of you do this. I went to Chinese school on Sundays when I was growing up in New Jersey. So for two hours on the on Sundays, we would drive out to Chinese school and I loved it because I had so many friends there and it was a very warm and welcoming community. When I got older, I didn't wanna go as much because I really wanted to focus on my regular school and my Chinese got worse and worse because I stopped practicing and I just stopped speaking it as much. So I really regretted it when I got to college and in college, I took more advanced Chinese lessons. So when I wrote Little Messy Marcy Sue, um, it was really important for me to include Chinese, to include Chinese words, to share that aspect of feeling like you're part of both cultures, of multiple cultures. So let's take a look at the chat and see the foreign languages that people speak. Okay, I see a lot here. Okay, I see, I'm gonna, I'm scrolling all the way up. It looks like we have Viet, Vietnamese, Spanish, Korean, Spanish, Chinese, Polish, Arabic. Well, that's a lot, a lot of Spanish speakers here. We have a lot of Spanish speakers in Texas also. Actually, my kids' school, they teach Spanish as well. Spanish and Korean, Spanish, I see lots of Spanish, and Chinese and Korean. Stony Point Elementary has Russian, French, and Spanish. Italian and French, Spanish, English, Spanish, Spanish, French, and Arabic. Now this is such a wonderful range. I love to see this. It's so important to learn um, the little Khmer language as well, Spanish, Arabic. I think it's so wonderful to learn other languages and um, it makes traveling so much fun. So I'm glad to see that there's so much. Wow, that's great. Okay, so I do want to talk a little bit about pronouncing Chinese words. So um, I speak Mandarin Chinese, but there are so many dialects in Chinese. So in Chinese, the intonation or the way you say a word, it's not just the sound of the word, but the tone is really important. So the different tones you use will give you a different, will, will be a totally different meaning in Chinese. In English, you can say a word with different tones and it still means the same thing. So if I say me, 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 it all means, it all means the same thing, it means me. In Chinese, the intonation changes the meaning of the word. So um, there's a high tone, which is like if you were to do, and I'll share my screen again because this is um, in the back of my book. There is high tone, which is a little bit like if you're in the doctor's office, I like to think of it this way, and you say ah, because it's kind of a higher tone. Um, and then there's second tone, which is like a rising tone. And it's like if, if you were to ask a question, so it's like yes, instead of yes, it's yes. A third tone is called like a low tone. And it's a little bit hard to describe because it sounds just like very normal speaking. But it's like it's the second yo and yo yo, like it, your voice goes down and dips a little bit. And then there's fourth tone, which is like, no, it's very forceful and it sounds like it's your voice is going down. And the fifth tone is neutral. 
So I like to give a little bit of an example, which is like the word ji in Chinese. So if you use the first tone, ji, like ah, ji, that means chicken. And if you say ji, which is like a rising second tone, that means like really urgent and rushed. And if you say ji, um, if you say, sorry, ji, it means very like, um, or ji, it means very like crowded or squeezed. And if you say ji, it means to like you're mailing something. So it's like the same word can mean um, so many different things uh, or that if based on the intonation that you use. So Chinese is very, it can be very difficult to learn when, um, you know, when you come from a more Latin based language, but it is, it's, you know, a very like rich language and very robust. And um, I would like to review some of the Chinese words from the story. And um, I'll demonstrate the intonation a little bit here. So the Chinese words, included wai po, and this means your maternal grandmother, which is your mother's mother. And there's wai gong, which is your mother's father. And in Chinese, um, you refer to your, your mom's parents um, with different words, wai po, wai gong, or po po gong gong, versus your dad's parents, which I call nai nai and gong gong. Um, and it's kind of interesting that some languages will separate it that way. And it's not like that in English, although you may have different nicknames for your grandparents on different sides. So in the story, um, Marcy's mom calls her Xiao Luan Luan, which means, it just means little messy, messy. And um, this is not like a typical uh, nickname. And uh, I just made this one up, but you know, parents always either make up nicknames for their kids or they may call them things that are already typical nicknames. So in Chinese, Bao Bei, which was also in this story, means like sweetheart or like my little precious one. And um, that's very common. And also there's a, a nickname, Xiao Tou Dan, which actually means little smelly egg, um, little stinky egg. But it's a very common uh, nickname for, <laughs> for, that, for parents to call their kids Xiao Tou Dan. And, um, you know, my sister calls her daughter Bing Bing, which means cookie. So um, this is another part where I'd like you guys to comment. I'd love to hear the nicknames that you have for your family members, for your grandparents, or for your parents. A lot of us call our parents mom or dad or mommy or daddy. Or you know your grandparents, you might call them grandma or grandpa. But I'd love to hear any kind of other nicknames. Like some people go by Nana, and sometimes it's Mimi. Sometimes um, you know it's based on the language you're in. So I'd love to see what nicknames you have for your family members, or if there are nicknames that you have. So not everybody goes by their name on their birth certificate. Sometimes they go by other nicknames because. That's all somebody in their family could pronounce when they were younger or something. So if there are nicknames that you guys have, I'd love to hear it too. So you can put those in the chat and I'll go through the rest of the Chinese words. So hao gan qing means very clean. Da yi means like, you're pretty proud of yourself. Like Mar Marcy was like really proud of herself for doing something. Hua ping means flower vase. Dao yin means noise. So this is when the mom heard something in the house and she turned away from what she was doing to pay attention to all that noise. And dao le means I've made it, like I like arrived. And aya is like what you say when you're surprised. Um, and actually sometimes it can be good or bad. It's just an expression of shock. And it's very, very common. And it's like, if you forget something, you'd be like, aya. Like, or if something good happens, like, yeah, like what a pleasant surprise. Like, it's like, wow, I didn't know that was gonna happen. So it actually is a little bit like, wow, it, it, it has that kind of universal, um, like you can use it in a lot of different scenarios. Okay, I'll stop sharing this now. And I hope that I can see some nicknames. Oh, wow, so many. Okay, so I'm scrolling here to look at the nicknames. And let's see, okay. I see 
Scarletti spaghetti. I love that. Um, Vivi or Vivi? Ev, B, Sweet Pea. Oh, Sweet Pea. That's really cute. Juju, so so. Nana, Papa, Chip, Mama, Yaya. Oh, I've heard a lot of Yaya's before for grandparents. Bean. I see Lucy Lou, Maya Papaya. We do lots of we do lots of rhyming nicknames in my household too. Um, Hads, Roro. Oh, we have a, my sister has a, a Roro in her family. Yo-Yo, Eve, Maybe, Maybe, Cowboy, Lily, Hayes, Nana, Clara, Bear. We have a lot of bears in my family too. We have lots of bear nicknames. Nerd, <laughs> Logi or Logi. Gigi, Grandma, Grandpa. I see, okay, there's more in the Q&A. Okay. Stinkweed, Junebug, Lovey, Peanut. Wow, so many. Hannah Banana. Oh, I love Hannah Banana, Hannah Bear. Oh, these are so wonderful, Papa. Rock from the Q&A. All oh, right. Geo, Mommy, Grandma. Wow, so many ladybugs. Wow, you guys are, you have lots of varied nicknames that I hadn't heard before. Maddie. I know sometimes Maddie can be short for Madeline. Um, Gigi, Noni. Noni, Poppy. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing those. I love that. I love that so much, Nana. Okay, great. Okay, so what I wanted to do is to also talk a little bit about Marcy's room in Little Messy Marcy Sue. So for me, one of the reasons it's so important to keep things clean is to help our brains keep track of where things are. So we can play a little memory game. So one of my picture, uh, my favorite pictures in Little Messy Mercy's, in Little Messy Mercy Sue is, is the picture of her room when it's really messy. And I think that the illustrator did, Julie Kwan, she did such an amazing job illustrating it with like a lot of color and detail. So um, I'll give everyone, I'm gonna, what we'll do is, it's so hard to process things when things are messy, right? And so I wanna give everyone a few seconds to study Marcy's room. And I want you to pay attention to all the details that you can. Pay attention to you know, what's on the walls, what's on the floors, everything. And then maybe we'll do a little bit of a quiz and see what you guys can remember. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Okay, so I think that you should all be able to see this screen now. Let me see if I can, no, I can't get rid of this, oops. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys about 30 seconds to really study the room. I'm gonna time it, 30 seconds, to really pay attention. So try to remember everything. It's so hard when a room is messy. So I'll give you a few seconds to study it. All right, pay attention to what's on the walls, the colors, the details, what she has in her room. All right, just five more seconds. Okay, that's 30 seconds. Okay, it is really hard when it's messy to pay attention to all those details, right? Okay, so let's play a little game and I'll have the teachers put this in the chat. Tell me, based on the things in Marcy's room, what are you? What do you think are some of Marcy's hobbies? What are? What do you think are things that she likes to do? She likes to make messes. She does. Yes, she likes to play with her pet. I totally agree. Her dog is with her all the time. She loves. Painting, yes, I saw those too. She has um, paint brushes. She was playing with mud outside. And she likes dress up too. I agree, she had the witch's hat, right? She likes to eat pizza. I like pizza too, I think everyone likes pizza. She likes space, you guys picked up on that, right? There was a box there that had a rocket ship and said NASA on it. She does like to play in the mud for sure. Wow, you guys remember a lot of these details. Collect unicorn soft toys. Yes, she actually has. All right, you guys are doing a much better job than I did the first time I tried to remember everything. So 
So yes, all these things. She likes stuffies, toys, totally. You know, I counted, she has six stuffies in that room. Puzzles, paint, playing with birds, pretend. These are great. You guys did a really good job. Puzzles, toys, playing with a dog. She's really crafty. You guys did a wonderful job. So you remembered everything in the picture a lot better than I did the first time. Good job, guys. Okay, so at this point, I think um, I wanted to make sure we leave a few minutes for any questions that you guys have. And um, Sarah, I don't know if you wanna go through them. Yes, thank you so much, Sherry. This has been so amazing. There's still so many good things coming in from the chat. Uh, and I hope you all add your questions to the Q&A or the chat so we can uh, ask Sherry as many of them as we can. We have one uh, so far from Rowan in second grade who asks, how long did it take you to write the book? You know, this is a, it's it's um, so hard to say because it was like a period over maybe just one or two months probably, or maybe even more than that. But it would be like, you know, anytime you have a project that you really wanna tackle that feels like a big project, you kind of have to do it in smaller pieces. So um, I would say it probably took well, maybe more than two months um, to write the initial draft. Um, and so after you write the initial draft, and this is, I think, with all writers, you spend so much time writing it the first time and you're like, oh, I'm done and I don't, I don't want, I don't need to change a thing. And then you share it with other people and they have wonderful, helpful feedback. And, um, you know, I would say that the initial part didn't take as long, but it was the revising that took a much longer period of time. And that was getting feedback from, you know, free feedback from, um, family and feedback from my agent. So after that, it was actually like from beginning to end, it was closer to like probably eight months of when I first started writing to when we felt like we had a complete product. How was it working with an illustrator? Uh, what, what did that relationship look like? You know, it's really interesting because um, the way it works in a lot of publishing houses is that you don't know the illustrator before you work with them and you submit just the words if you don't if you're not an illustrator, you submit just the words and the art director at the um, publishing house, they select the art director, uh, they select the illustrator based on a style, but they gave me a few options. And when I saw Julie Plans, I thought it was so, so amazing and kind of was exactly what I would have imagined for the story. And since then I've met her and she is like, she's wonderful and she's so artistic and, um, you know, she was really open to feedback as we were going along. Also, like the very first draft, I think, didn't have a dog. And you notice that the dog was not included in any of the text. And the first time I got the pictures back, I was like, you know what? I was picturing a dog there and it, and everyone felt the same way. So we added a dog, which totally goes with the story. And of course, it's right beside her making a mess too. So it really is an interesting process of what they can bring to the story that wasn't necessarily there to begin with. That's awesome. Um, okay, we have some other questions. Evelyn in second grade wants to know, is this your first book? Yes, this is my first book. And it is so such an it was such an exciting process. Um, I think that I will want to keep writing books and have um, been trying to spend time during the pandemic doing that, but it's a little bit challenging. But I'm so excited to have written something and I feel really lucky to have it out there in the world. Excellent. Um, there's a couple questions I'm going to try to combine. Um, so someone asked, what gave you the idea to write this particular book and kind of what inspired you to, to want to write generally? Yeah, you know, I had been writing a few things um, and it was really, it was having children. And I think that, um, you know, there was this one day that my daughter was just like saying, I want mommy, I want mommy. And she did it in a way that was very sing-songy and it sounded like I kind of like made a rhyme out of it and then I started writing it down and so I started writing that way it was really having kids and like at the time I was just like reading so many books to my kids too um that I feel like it was like a, a combination of those factors and um this particular story is kind of inspired by you know children in general like I love how helpful kids are when you ask them to do something and I think what's like kind of wonderful about it and magical, um, but it's also a little tricky is how, um, you know, because they're learning, they don't necessarily get it right the first time, but I love that. And I think it's like so wonderful to have kids try. 
And so this book was like a little bit about that, you know, having kids try to do things themselves, even if it's not perfect. Awesome. All right. We are sadly right at time, but we have time for one more question. Um, and someone asked, do you have advice for anyone out there who is hoping to write a book as well? Yeah. You know, I think that, um, I think you can get inspiration from anything anywhere around you. Um, the one thing that I read that I think was really, really helpful is that it's really, you know, it's really easy to criticize and talk about how something's bad, and it's really easy to write something bad. So, it's like the the advice was to just write something bad and then criticize it yourself until it's good, because it's really easy to criticize, right? And it's really easy to write something bad. So you put those things together, and at least you have a starting point. And I think that's the most important thing is to put pen to paper with a good starting point. That is excellent advice. Sherry, thank you so much. I'm so sorry that it is time for us to wrap things up. Well, thank everyone, you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in. You all have been wonderful in the Q&A and on the chat. We have been so thrilled to have you here. Um, thank you again, Sherry. Uh, everyone, you can visit vabook.org to explore the full schedule of upcoming Virginia Festival of the Book events and also learn more about Sherry's upcoming event in the festival later this month. Uh, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for joining and for listening. Bye. Bye.